Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to the, to the Labor Day edition of Kibitzing with Kagan. It is really my great honor to welcome as my special guest, Donna Edwards, the president of Maryland's AFL-CIO. Donna, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Thank you, I was honored with the invitation. Absolutely. So before we start, some people may be confused by the fact that there were two ferociously successful and important Marylanders named Donna Edwards. How often did, were, were people confused? In the beginning, uh, the first time that Donna campaigned and went to some of our union halls, they were expecting to see me. Uh -huh. And then after she was elected and, and became you know, the dynamo that she was, then some people were disappointed when I showed up. <laughs> so it just continued. I doubt that. So for those who may not know or remember, Donna Edwards served Maryland's fourth uh, congressional district uh, in Congress for several terms and then ran for the Senate uh, unsuccessfully uh, to Chris Van Hollen, but is still a uh, visible face sometimes on, uh, on media as a progressive spokesman. Very much so, yes. But we're here to talk about you and you have a remarkable background uh, of standing up for uh, through social work, and through labor advocacy, and so much more. Why don't you start by telling us about your background, West Virginia, your journey, and how you got to where you are now? Well, I, I'm born and bred in Cumberland, Maryland, and both parents were from West Virginia. My mother's a Harmon from Harmon, so everybody there was my cousin. And my father grew up mainly in Canaan Valley, where now all the people go and play. Mm -hmm. uh, where all of those uh, rich houses are, that was my playground growing up. So um, they sold it when I was uh, in my late teens. But I started in social work and I got my undergrad in, at WVU and my graduate at the University of Maryland. But I really believe that anybody who wants to be called a social worker should be in public welfare for at least a year or two. And that's mm -hmm. why even though I had jobs, I made it a point to go work in Baltimore City, and I worked in Baltimore City Department of Social Services, which is part of the state mm -hmm. uh, Department of Human Services for 23 years. And I became the president of AFSCME Local 112, which is a Maryland Social Services Employees Union. I'm That's just statewide. Spell out the the acronym for those who may not know, AFSCME is the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, one of the largest in and most effective unions in the nation. Very much so. And our local is the largest state local in, in the state. And I've been president since 1984. That's amazing. Um, we've had amazing officers and activists and people who I've mentored and, and they've helped me grow. Um, the local is definitely the wind beneath my wings. And I then was the first woman president of AFSCME Council 92, which is now Council 3, and that was in uh, 1992. And then I got tapped to be the secretary treasurer, the first woman right. for the Maryland State and DC. We have two jurisdictions, AFL-CIO. And then in 2016 became the first woman president. I like to say I kicked a lot of glass ceiling, Cheryl, but I never filed for workers' comp. <laughs> I like that. Uh, there's so many things I want to talk to you about today, Donna. Let's start with trailblazing. So you and Barbara Mikulski were among the really the, the early foremothers um, of just sort of badass women in charge in Maryland. Uh, talk about some of the barriers, some of the challenges that you had. Well, I'm so glad you brought up Barbara. That, I mean, she started at DSS. In, at 1510 Guilford, where I ended up my career. Mm. And, um, you know, she, I, I actually got the Oni Barbara Mikulski uh, Trailblazing Award she gave me. And I treasure that among everything. Yeah. Um, you know, in the beginning and, and years ago, you really had to, as a woman, decide when, you know, it was novel for you to be in the room and making comments and kind of fighting back and how far you could go with that until you became the shrill voice in the room. Yes. And with me starting so young, I was a shop steward at 23. Wow. Most of the leaders 
uh, of the unions and especially within the AFL-CIO in Baltimore Metro, they were older and I was only a few years older than their children or their mm -hmm. daughters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had to kind of have respect for that. Yeah. And um, I still do. Uh, you know, generations, uh, backgrounds, culture, we all embrace each other different, talk differently. Sure. Um, you know, I grew up in a family that was pro-worker, pro-union, although it, it was a split family. My father was a Democrat. My mother was a Republican. Oh, my. And so, you know, that's why I listened to both sides and yeah. formed the relationships. There you go. So years before, decades before the Me Too movement, did you ever experience or how how bad was it were you sexually harassed or more just patronized it, it is really strange that i was talking with gerald jackson who's the secretary treasurer of the state fed uh earlier today and we were talking about you know just harassment in general bullying um sexual harassment mm -hmm. and he said he's really glad that women's voices are heard and listened to mm -hmm. um and uh you know, I wouldn't trade what I've done. It, I have absolutely no re regret over anything. Yes. Um, you know, I will say there might have been a leader or two who went too far and I would send somebody down the hall because they might have been on their knees. Mm. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, so while we're, before we leave gender, uh, Liz Schuler is the new president Terrific. of the national AFL-CIO and the first woman in that role. Tell me how you think that's going to uh, transform the labor movement for the nation. I, I think that this is just, you know, a wonderful opportunity. I have to say, uh, uh, we none of us liked it how it happened. And I've actually known Rich Trumka since I was 28 years old. Shocking. He was 33. And um, he actually got an award as a as the president of the miners mm -hmm. from the iron workers down in Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And so um, President McEntee of AFSME sent me there and I met Rich and he was young in his union. I was young in mine. And we just kind of continued that relationship. But Liz has come on. Um, she was the youngest secretary treasurer we had. And um, she's, she's always taking on a new perspective and a new way. And I think that, you know, um, Rich would be very proud of the direction that we are going to be going. Yes. And we're definitely going to be following in everything that he's laid out. Um, obviously it is a well-known fact that uh, we were a totally unified, movement in uh, moving forward on getting Biden elected. Yes. And there's a lot before us. And we're hoping that we're not hoping we're demanding yes. that the Senate follows through. We are definitely going to circle back to that. OK, um, let's but Liz is going to do a fabulous job. And right now I saw a statistic that about 65 percent of the union movement is women. That's amazing. Yes. But not always 65% of leadership, right? No, it's not. There's only seven state fed presidents that are female. Yeah. Yeah. Out of 51. So let's talk about the reality of the numbers. So union membership has been declining over the years, um, which is a challenge uh, in so many ways. Why don't you start for those who may not be aware the importance of the union movement uh, in some of the rights we take for granted, the 40 hour work week, the eight hour day, no child labor and stuff. Why don't you talk about those? This this episode will be airing on Labor Day when we should be which, honoring which is and remembering our workers. Which is wonderful. Uh, and I, I so appreciate you doing this. I, I really do. Absolutely. Uh, we've been in decline since the Reagan triple down, uh, trickle down, I mean, and yeah. um, you can also see the wage gap and the wealth gap that has been created in the country with um, people, policymakers making it so difficult for people to join unions. Yes. And a, a strong middle class is dependent on having a labor movement mm -hmm. that's viable and, and working together. 
people who really understand what collective bargaining is, what unions are, it's a partnership between management and labor. And the discussions that you have at the bargaining table are about, you know, where are we going to be for the next three years or four years? And there should be a sharing of the wealth. There should be a sharing and a value and a dignity in all work. Respect, absolutely. And that's all that, that is asked for. Mm -hmm. The advantage is um, with you, women make more, men make more, people of color make more, everyone, if they have, are in a union. But we yeah. lift up every other group that's around. And so, I mean, even public education was fought for by the unions yes. in the early 20s and 30s. Yes. Child labor laws, all kinds of protections for workers. Yep. Um, even with COVID, we, we had to stand head and shoulders and, and fight like hell, not just for essential workers that you could see, but for all the people that were behind the scenes. That is one of the questions I wanted to ask about, but I have to say one of the things that makes me crazy is the renaming of DCA uh, airport, national airport, after Ronald Reagan busted the air traffic controllers union, the idea that they would name that airport in honor of him, in memory of him is just nuts. So I it always is. call it DCA or national, but I won't call I it. I call it national. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about COVID. Certainly teleworking uh, was beneficial for many workers in staying safe and saved commuting time and all that, but it also meant less opportunity to collaborate, to build the relationships between workers and supervisors and all that. Tell me, tell me how you think teleworking is for, for the union movement. I think that that's why it's such, it's, it's exciting that we have Liz Schuler as president because she has seen that work has been changing. And even at our 2017 convention of the AFL-CIO, uh, we, we established uh, a whole committee on looking at the way that work is changing. And I did at our last convention um, because we, we knew even before COVID that the way that people earn wages is, is gonna be very different. Yes. And with the gig economy, et cetera. Um, I think in, in total though, I'm very concerned, and this is where the social work comes in, of our mental health. No question. During, you know, how are we going to recover, not, not just from this isolation, but like you said, all the opportunities of growth and forming relationships and having relationship with your coworkers and with management. Yes. And then being part of the, the broader community, which, you know, union members are all very active in the community most of the time. Yes. And so I'm I'm concerned that our country, our people were angrier or short tempered. Um, there's divided. just Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and that's a symptom yeah. that goes back to issues of mental health. Not yeah. it's not the issue. Um, and, and we're seeing the violence more and more. Yeah. Um, you know, you see it on the buses, you see it with the postal workers, you see it on everywhere. The I mean, everywhere. The here. airplanes, uh, you know. Um, so as as you know, I've been working for mental health coverage and even workers' compensation for the courageous women and men under the headset uh, in our 911 center yes. because they have brutal jobs. They have to listen to suicides and murders and dying family members, and it's just awful. And they're expected to hang up and take the next call. So, yeah. No, and I think that's a big issue. And and I will say right here, I want to work with you. Great. A lot more on this issue. Great, would love you know, that. Um, we have very courageous men and they shouldn't have to be courageous yeah. all around our union movement and who have taken this on, our, you know, firefighters and yep. EMTs and said, look, it takes a strong man to ask for help. It takes a strong woman to ask for help. Amen. And that's what we need to destigmatize yes. mental health. Your brain is just an organ. Yes. Like everything else, and it needs help now and then. Amen. So I don't want to detour into 911. Okay. You know I can talk about that all day. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you, um, we lost another 911 specialist to um, death by suicide in Hartford County recently. 
And yeah. uh, so this is not a hypothetical challenge. It's, mm -hmm. it's truly a, a brutal, really tough, tough job. But let's go back to um, essential workers. And how is it that, that essential workers had any rights through COVID or continue to have? It's disappointing. I, I, it's still disappointing to me, Cheryl, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we had a good try with an essential worker bill that got completely watered down. People were talking about them being heroes and wonderful. And then now let's let's get back to work, get yourself in there, you know, whether it's a crap job or, um, you know, a job, business, just like workers have now decided to take a different look at their value. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's going on. People say, oh, no, it's because they got all this money. No, right. they feel valued. Over 60% of people during COVID took online classes. Mm -hmm. They also saw that their family life improved. They also saw that they're scheduling. They're not going to go to jobs that say, uh, you've got to be on my clock not your clock. I don't care that you have a two-year-old or a 17-year-old or that you want to take classes. That's not going to work for people anymore. Right. And so the essential worker, we had to fight like how we still are. Um, I think it was also, a, a, it, it talked about our society that retail workers and bus drivers and others were pitted against the public that didn't want to wear masks. Yeah. And they had to fight it and they have no training on that, mm -hmm. but they had to say, put on your mask mm -hmm. and, and face all of the abuse of people who didn't want to. Right. It's, we haven't rewarded them enough and we never will. Okay. And I'm going to keep preaching that forever. Good. So let's go back to the Biden Harris administration and mm -hmm. how exciting that we have Biden and Harris helping lead our yes. country and Certainly the transition from the Trump administration uh, was by definition going to be challenging uh, and rocky, but, uh, but the priorities and the, the policies are, are back in a good direction. Tell me what some of your uh, priorities are and your hopes and expectations from this administration. Well, our number one priority is that, well, I can't say it is number one. We want to pass the PRO Act. And the PRO Act is so important because I know people do not believe in this day and time that workers get fired for trying to form a union. But we have a perfect example at the Walters Museum in Baltimore City, where we're trying to organize over 70% of the workers are, you know, have signed interest cards for the union and, and they've let go mm -hmm. one of the major activists for the union. That's mm -hmm. now, that's today. Mm -hmm. And when people say you don't need the PRO Act, yes, you do. Mm -hmm. You need that because the, the rules have just been changed so far away from having um, a, a just way of dealing with most of the businesses. Mm -hmm. And so even in this state, we tried to run a bill that would allow union members to still deduct their dues, but also there was a bill that would not allow businesses who hire anti-union lawyers to take that off as a business expense. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that wasn't allowed. You know, they have to have a business expense for being anti-union. Mm -hmm. So, but you're not rewarded for being pro-union. I'm disappointed to hear about the Walters. That is totally my favorite museum in Maryland. It's a beautiful place. It is. Yeah, I hope they come around. And workers, I mean, you know, librarians and museum workers. Right now, we have the highest, we being unions, the, the polls show people really support unions and would join by the millions if they had the right to do it yes. and if they could form a union. Well, let's talk about a success you had last year, finally, community colleges. Um, yeah. So why don't you talk about that journey, why you think it was important and, uh, and what you expect going forward in that? Well, I really want to give a shout out to SEIU 500. They stuck with this bill forever. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's important to SEIU and AFSME and- um, SEIU Service Employees International yes. Union. Yes, Service Employees International, AFT, American Federation of Teachers, AFSME, we've already talked about. Um, community college workers, and they, they need to have representation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was one of the last groups that are in, but we still have thousands of public employees that are not allowed to collectively bargain in this state. Mm -hmm. 
and collectively bargain it's it's really collective negotiations right and you know people argue oh well it's going to break the budget it's going to do that nobody is going to negotiate themselves out of a job right you know i mean we're not we we want to work but we want to work in a place where we can have some debate and conversation right. and and truthfully having schedules and safety and a voice yes are as important as the wages well i can tell you as a former adjunct faculty at montgomery college uh i taught a couple of semesters I think three different semesters on state and local government. And I loved it. And, but I put in an insane number of hours. I had a team teacher uh, with the late delegate, Jean Cryer, and then, and then uh, another smart person. And I'll tell you if, <laughs> I don't know if I ultimately on an hourly basis made two or $3 an hour, but I not much more than that, if that. I totally understand. I was an adjunct at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So we do it for the love and for the students, and yeah. that's good, but it sure is nice to be able to pay our rent, our mortgage, our food, our phone bills, and all that. So yeah. And and more and more of the community colleges are using adjuncts. No question. And you know, and moving them around. It's a way they think of saving money. Of course. Of course. Well, let's pivot to uh, your legislative priorities for 2022. What's going to be top of, top couple of issues on your list in an election year? And we will get to the election in a bit. Well, we're going to continue. One of the, the trends that we've been doing is looking at all of the credits, all of the tax credits that are used to support good jobs, mm -hmm. supposedly. Mm -hmm. um, and in Maryland, the majority of money that is spent um, on these tax credits is coming from income tax. And that income tax generally is coming from the bulk of people that are workers from 50,000 to 250,000. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it is just not a correct policy that we are not enforcing and making sure that when we use taxpayers' dollars for a business to create jobs, that they are not creating high road jobs. Right. Jobs that are paying more than 15% over the minimum wage, jobs that have health care and a retirement, and also have a career advantage. Right. And have scheduling, you know, these kinds of things, the right to organize and, and to always make sure any tax credit should include that the employer is paying workers' compensation and unemployment taxes. Okay, well, look forward to learning more about that. So let's pivot to the reality that 2022 is an election year. Let's start first with uh, what do you hope to get in our next governor? What do you hope to see? What characteristics? And do you think the AFL-CIO will be endorsing a candidate for governor? For me, and I, I'm only going to speak for me right now. Sure. I want a governor that wants to govern the state of Maryland. It is not looking to become something beyond the governor of the state of Maryland. Okay. We need someone focused on that job and in wanting to truly uh, dig in and get some things right, straighten some, some other things, you know, policies that are not helpful, um, move them around. Maryland has way too big of a spread in, in the wealth gap for being the richest state. We have far too many people over 56% receiving some sort of public assistance mm. way before COVID, mm. way before COVID. So we have the haves and have nots in this state. And this should be a state where we have an economy that works for everybody mm. and that everyone can thrive. And it doesn't matter where they've been born or to whom they've been born, but the opportunity is there in Maryland. And that's what we need is a person who wants to govern. Amen. What do you think? Well, let's go the negative, then we'll go positive. What is, um, what is the policy issue that you most fervently disagree with current governor, Larry Hogan, and what he's done the last eight years, seven years? Wow. That is a hard thing for me. I, I think that um, 
I don't think that the door has been open to the unions. I think that he has really um, shut off communication with the leadership of the state employees, mainly AFSCME. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether or not people like each other in politics, we all have to get along when, when we represent the same people. Agreed. And so we need to move that forward. Yep. Um, I will tell you that I'm the first woman, as I've said, but I am the first president that has not been on the Board of Public Works, uh, not the Board of Public Works, um, the uh, Workforce Alliance hmm. that the governor has. Hmm. And I've asked for that appointment um, for several years. In fact, I should have replaced the outgoing president and hmm. did apply for that. Hmm. Um, so, and, and I do think that um, definitely uh, the mishandling of the unemployment and that decision yeah. was mishandled. It really was, and, and it still is. Way of saying it, it's it's yes. been just nightmarish. These yeah. poor residents, my constituents in, in Rockville and Gaithersburg, who earned unemployment benefits and are still waiting months and months and months and months. It's insane. It it is insane, and you know, I mean, you can blame so much on. <laughs> a new system, right. a new data system, and then you have to, to really look at where's the management of it. But there's a second new data system, and then there's a third new data system. At right. some point, you want to get deliverables, right? You would think you they would have tested them a few million times before buying them and it has right. to fail again. Um, tell me something that you think Governor Hogan has done that you applaud. Mm. Wow. I, you know, I, Cheryl, I have to be honest, I don't pay much attention to what comes from the governor. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I, I really just don't know okay. right offhand okay. what I could say. That's fine. Uh, talk about the legislative elections in 2022. Um, any goals, thoughts, priorities? No, I, you know, our endorsement process Right now, what we've been doing, um, because Maryland makes it kind of odd, you you really don't officially have to say you're running until February 22nd of 22. I know. So, you know, um, so that kind of ties my hands in officially saying, let's do these interviews or et cetera. But we've been having conversations mm -hmm. with um, everyone who's running for state office. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I open it up to all of our affiliates. And I don't know if everybody knows, I mean, we have over 700 affiliated local unions. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so, you know, anybody can join these conversations that's in leadership. And they've been really interesting, fruitful. Um, people have been very candid. And uh, I think that we're getting a feel for where candidates are. We haven't done it with all the legislators yet. And so we have five central labor councils. We have Western Maryland, Central Maryland, Delmarva, which is all the Eastern shore. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that most people are aware of is Baltimore Metro and DC Metro mm -hmm. that has, um, you know, five of the Maryland counties. And so the Central Labor Councils and, and the State Fed, we're going to be working together so as not to have um, some confusion and, and just kind of have a solid process going forward. Mm -hmm. It is really important that we, we continue to move forward and that we address all of the issues. Right. Um, for me, I'm looking at the changing workforce. I'm looking at what we need um, post-COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's really an important piece there. You talk about businesses that have to build back. Think about workers who really are going to be going back, who might have used up all of their leave. In fact, they probably have. They have now no vacation leave, no you know personal leave, no uh, sick leave, and they might have had leave built up for ten years. Yes. Just yeah. waiting for the kids to graduate and they could take their dream vacation. And right. how do you build back your personal life mm -hmm. after all of this? Mm -hmm. So yes. as you can see that it gets light and dark, it's because I have two windows 
and the sun comes out and then it goes back behind the clouds. That's what's going on. I, I don't want you all to think I'm having flashes of great ideas. It's just, it's, it's the sun shining. <laughs> it's all good. It's uh, God approving of that answer, yeah, and lighting up, you know, whatever that is. Um, uh, well, you're going to be busy with so many things next year. And, you know, and election years are an opportunity for advocacy organizations like the AFL-CIO to hold us accountable, whether it's incumbents seeking re-election or new candidates seeking office and uh, educating and, uh, and having those dialogues. So that's going to be yeah. fun. Quick question. Are you going to be engaged in any way publicly or privately on the issue of redistricting? Do you guys weigh in on that? Not really. Okay. No. Um, it is your decision. We elected you. Right. We have faith in you. And um, we'll be watching it very closely. Of course. And it's also, you know, providing some speculation of people. I will tell you that the first thing that we will be looking at everyone to do, and that is to do the veto overrides. Yes. In December. And, uh, you know, we've sent our concerns to the leadership. Right. to make sure that we have those veto overrides. Yes. You worked hard on those bills. You got the votes. Mm -hmm. We need to move forward on those. Yes. You know, yes. and we'll be watching closely too how the state works with uh, the Biden administration in receiving so much of the money. Um, obviously, we want the PRO Act, but we also, the infrastructure bill is huge. And let's face it, we have got to protect voting rights. We have got to, or this country will change for the worse in a very short amount of time. I so we are very much fighting for voting rights. Good, good. Maryland has moved forward in a lot of ways, but watching the, the backward trends around the country has just been just frightening. And it is. Yeah. I went to a rally on Capitol Hill a couple of weeks good. ago for the People Act and uh bunch of legislators came in from around the country, but we've got to speak up and, and join that effort here. So we do. Um, before we go to our, the fast five, oh, no. two, two more quick questions. One is, do you expect to be involved in Maryland's first congressional district? I don't want to leave that out. The opportunity to defeat yes. Andy Harris and help yes. Heather Mazier. Yes. Good. Yes. We Good. never give him a free pass. Good. So I'm a big fan of Heather Mazier's and she's going to put together a ferocious campaign and she's she's pretty fabulous. So, OK, well, I look forward to knocking doors and phone banking alongside your members then. Uh, last question before uh, before the fast five. Uh, tell me what inspires you, what lifts you up? You've got to have really hard days and defeats and setbacks and frustrations. How do you keep going? What what gets you to, to keep charging forward? Cheryl, there are so many things, but something my father said a long time ago uh, when I was involved in the union and, and this, and he was watching Congress, and I, you know, I don't know what they were dickering about at the time. And he said, you do more work for people in one day than those, whatever he wanted to call them, do in a year. Wow. And it is always good, just like you said earlier, our unions, the union movement is not about just the members. Everything we do for our members lifts up other workers mm -hmm. and gives more power to other workers. Yes. Anyone who is working for wages and a salary, that, that's who we are. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can rest at night knowing that every day I have helped make something better. I don't, you know, when I was in social work and I had some professor say to me or tell the class, you know, you're, you teach people to cope. There was never a time in my life I wanted to teach anybody to cope. Mm -hmm. I always want to teach to change. You don't have to cope with it, change it. Love and, that. and that's what I live with. Love that. Well, Donna Edwards, your leadership is so important and so valuable every day. And uh, I want to just wrap up with our fast five que okay. questions, uh, quick ways of letting people get to know a little bit more about you. So question number one, who is your favorite author? Oh, wow. Maya Angelou. Lovely. What is the first news source you turn to in the morning to find out what's going on? Oh, God. I'm a channel flipper. 
I, I, I'm a channel flipper. I, I go MSNBC, Morning Joe, and then CNN, and then back, and I will stop on Fox. I can't take it, but, you know, short, short blurps and go back and <laughs> forth, but I, I got to know what people are thinking and talking about. You're I have not gone further right than Fox, okay? Yeah. I have Can't tried Fox. I just, it's, it's tough. Just in a, just a minute. You just, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah. For you. Uh, question three. Um, if neither COVID nor money were an obstacle, where would you want to travel? Oh my gosh. I want to go to Egypt. Okay. Nice. I've been there. What, I want to go. What makes you choose Egypt? Oh, I have studied um, so much about e Egyptian history and all of that. In fact, when I was a kid and we got the world book, I taught myself all the hieroglyphics for um, the letters because they're right in the world book, remember, right, right there. Right. And I can still recognize Donna and my middle name is Susan. So I can still recognize that in hieroglyphics That's according cool. to the world book. That's awesome. Good for you. Um, Question four, if there were a movie being made about your life, who would you want, which actress would you want to play you? Oh my God, I think Shirley MacLaine. Nice choice, very cool, okay. She's, she's multi-dimensional and who knows what life she would be on if she played me. <laughs> Love that. Uh, and the fifth question, Donna Edwards, the one that I do ask everyone, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is something you're really good at that most folks can't do? I'm really good at not taking anything personally. Okay, I, I was one of the, I'm the best daughter my parents ever had. I'm a very loyal friend. I'm a so-so sister, that's me. The rest of this is what I do, what I love, what I value, but it's not personal. I love that. That's a really good superpower. Good for you. And that comes in handy in your position. So it does. Very good. Well, Donna Edwards, thank you. Thank you for kibitzing with me today. Thank you for You're all welcome. that you do. And I look forward to seeing you in person before too long. I hope so. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Happy Labor Day to Happy everyone. Labor. Yes. Hey!